First, I want to apologize to you. I cannot believe your graduate guide showed up on his motorcycle. I do not care if Dick Malott's van would not start. I can promise you, Jim will never make it out of my class on Skinner's, I mean your, recent writings. Think nothing of it. Every department has its screw-ups. It sounds like this fellow Jim Northrup still needs some lessons in problem solving. I mean, where did he think I was going to sit on that Kawasaki of his? I mean I had briefcase and a cane. Besides, it was raining. Perhaps as punishment, I will recommend him to the ASU group at Utah State. Talk about strange bedfellows, Mormonism and behaviorism. Anyway, I want to thank you for coming and giving a lecture in my class. It saved me having to prepare for another class on verbal behavior. After teaching the same book for 10 years you'd think I could wing it, but I still have to read the chapter the night before, which as you must know is pretty much a yawner. Do you think they understood that part about autocritics? Several of the men kept giggling. Each time I said I think it is raining, one of them would say, yeah right. Well it was raining. Perhaps they didn't understand why you didn't self-edit and use a stronger autocritic. Of course I am no expert on verbal behavior. You know, I love talking about verbal behavior with my students at Harvard, but here, with your students, well, some of my reference seemed to pass over their heads like stars in the night. I saw a lot of glassy eyes and rumping male foreheads this afternoon. I don't think even Ursula Andress could have raised those boys' heads. I never pay any attention to sleeping students or confused looks in that class. If I did, I wouldn't teach verbal behavior. By the way, those were some very good interverbals and magical man's just men. What about my puns? Do you think the students understood my little jokes? Well, they should have. I mean your puns had multiple sources of strength, and that is all that matters according to you. By the way, that pun about women burning their foundation garments resulting in reduced reinforcement was inspired. The pun came to me all of a sudden. It was right after looking at those two girls in the front row. Yes, Barb and Debbie. Perhaps in the future you should say the behavior of burning bras could be an example of a behavior that is both positively reinforcing and an example of negative reinforcement. Please, I don't want to get into the confusion between positive and negative reinforcement. I wish I had never invented the frickin' term. Don't we all? Where was Dick Fox when I needed him? Probably sitting next to Barb and Debbie. The whole confusion over positive and negative reinforcement has become so aversive. I wish it would just go away. If I hear Charlie Cantani explaining the difference to a student at one more APA cocktail hour, I might have to go back to writing fiction. No, I don't think you need to go that far. One wall then two is sufficient for a lifetime. Perhaps you should be more like J.D. Salinger. So, what is the plan for tonight? I feel like I am very deprived and I need a bar to press. Well, I cannot promise anything but, we have a cocktail hour to go to and then a dinner party at Fred Galt's. Will there be graduate students at the party? After my day today, I'm not sure I can talk to another graduate student. All their questions about freaking fixed ratio schedules and, then listening to their criticism and reviews of my books. I felt like I was at Cambridge. You know free love and communes didn't really exist when I went to Hamilton College. Don't worry about tonight. Wait until you see the group from Stimulus Control and Decmalot's 150 crew. Talk about polydipsia. And, wait until you see Fred Galt's graduate assistant. Talk about your double SDs. <laughs> Oh, and make sure you act surprised, but our secretary purchased great gifts for you and Fred Keller. She said they were a real steal. Time to go.